Introduction of Methodology Causes of War Methodology is the way that we add validity to our conclusions when we do a scientific study. This is the most important lecture that I give. I give this lecture as the first lecture of every single course that I teach. There is nothing withheld in this lecture. All of it is important. It will guide the final writing of your paper. It will take you probably a couple of readings to grasp the basics of this lecture. And you will spend the rest of your life, as I have, trying to apply it correctly. It is vital. So what we're going to use is positivist methodology. We're not using it because it's ideologically correct. We're using it because as a particular scientific approach, it's useful for creating valid conclusions. The pure scientist often ridicules the social scientist as imprecise. But let's put it in context. The pure scientist views the world as sort of a clock. You've got definite components with very specific operations that can be very accurately measured. Boiling water, measuring pressure, combining certain elements to create new compounds. But a social scientist has a vision of the world that is different. They see the world as a cloud. Clouds are real. They're tangible. But they're made up of innumerable smaller components. And it makes it very difficult to predict the particular shape of a cloud at any one time. Human society is like a cloud. Humans interact with each other in complex ways. If we were to take a rock and throw it down a hill, it would hit trees and other rocks on its way down. If we were to take an individual and throw him off a cliff, that individual would try strategically to avoid hitting trees, to minimize their damage as they go down the hill. So humans are interactive. They react between nature and they react between each other. There's an interesting experiment called the Hawthorne experiment that comes out of the business school. There was a factory that manufactured components for a telephone company. And uh, there were hypotheses about the impact of lighting on performance. And so the experimenters conducted interviews with the employees. They then increased the lighting effect uh, in the factory and they noticed that productivity went up. They then dimmed the lights, hypothesizing that it would reduce productivity. And again, they interviewed the uh, workers and they discovered that productivity went up even higher. What they discovered was the reactivity effect, that interacting with the subjects caused unpredictable outcomes. The factory workers enjoyed giving feedback. So, they committed more to work and it increased productivity. Rather than light decreasing, when the light was dimmed, decreasing their productivity, it actually increased their productivity. So humans are like decision makers that interact with other decision makers in hugely complex ways. This is essentially the problem of power. This is essentially the problem of predicting outcomes that are complex in social organization like war. The pure scientists may lament the lack of precision in the social sciences, but the social sciences are both very important because they deal with problems like war that pure science does not, and because we're faced with an incredibly big problem of how to conduct accurate measurements. Again, clouds are real, societies are real, and the problems they examine are real. Here you can see the depiction of the Norman Baya Tapestry, which depicted the 1066 invasion of England 
by William the Bastard. So the core issue for the social scientific method is epistemology. How do you know what you know? If as a social scientist you conduct a study and you come up with a conclusion and you then deliver this research to your sponsor, it could be a government agency, it could be a private sector agency, they're going to want to know the source of the validity of your conclusions. This is why methodology matters. And we do this within the context of the scientific method. Here you can see a depiction of Saladin, a conqueror from the Near East. There are two sources of information. The first is deduction and the second is induction. These are ideal types and they both have a role to play in the scientific approach. So you need to know both of them. Deduction is axiomatic reasoning. It's drawing conclusions from postulates. It uses internal consistency criteria for validation. So it's essentially a logical language. For example, since wars make people suffer, we could deduce that it would be rational for most people to wish to, wish to avoid war. This is a prediction. Right? It's entirely logical. Induction is empirical reasoning, where empirical means knowledge obtained through research from nature. So you're drawing conclusions from observed behavior. This uses external consistency criteria for validation. It looks at nature and tries to determine whether this phenomenon is present or not in nature. For example, if we want to know where war is most frequent, we have to go out into nature and make a count. Where are the wars happening? If we could give sort of a, a, a personified analogy, deduction is like Plato sitting and coming up with logical deductions, but without ever venturing out into nature. Induction is like Aristotle, who had no preconceived notion of evolution or natural selection, but he made a collection of fetuses, human, from pigs, from uh, birds, from fish, and he noticed that all fetuses were very similar in shape. And he concluded that it's possible that there's a common origin or a common origin of development of all life though he didn't have a theory that he was testing. He just simply made the observation. Now, in political science, we use both deduction and induction. We use deduction when we have difficulty observing nature. We can't easily travel to a hostile capital. For example, visiting the Kremlin in Moscow during the Cold War and finding out what their military policy was we would be arrested. So we have theories that we apply at a distance. We gather what data we have without going to Moscow and we come up with a conclusion. We use induction when we're not sufficiently confident about our underlying causal logic. You know, we don't know how or why a phenomenon happened. In these instances, we go to the location of the phenomenon and conduct a count or a measurement to find out what happens. In the social sciences, we do both, but we're supposed to be using deduction first, and we'll talk about that later. Here you can see the 1746 Battle of Culloden between the Highlanders against a combination of uh, lowlanders from Scotland and the British Army. The final paper for this course has eight elements. Just as any scientific paper or scientific book does. So you should eventually internalize and memorize these eight steps because it'll guide all narrative research projects. So a theory, which is a possible explanation of events, has eight elements. Here you can see post-World War II 
uh, Berlin at the end of, uh, end of the conflict. The first part of the paper is the research question, or better, the puzzle or the problem. A research question is something like, you know, why do wars happen? It's interesting, it's valid, but the problem with the research question is it's not particularly directional, it's not poignant. What's better is a puzzle. For example, if all states should prefer peace, why did the US pursue policies that brought about war with Iraq in 2003? See, we have a general assumption war is, is, is undesirable, um, and then we have the event which contradicts it. And we want to then solve this puzzle, solve this contradiction. So puzzles are a lot more desirable. And reshaping a research question into a puzzle makes your paper much more clear in its purpose. Counterintuitive theories and ones that oppose the basic conventional wisdom are the most interesting. For example, there was a book in the mid-1990s called Bombing to Win by Pape. One third of the U.S. defense budget went to the U.S. Air Force. And the U.S. Air Force has almost doctrinally argued since the 1940s that you don't need to have a large army to fight a war. You could just send an Air Force. It would save lives. It would save time. And so the Air Force justified its enormous budget and its enormously expensive aircraft platforms on this basis. But Pape wrote a book saying airplanes have never won a war on their own. The whole doctrine is without foundation. And he then looked at an endless number of case studies and demonstrated this to be true. So Pape challenged the conventional wisdom that victory could come through air power. And he did a very good methodological job of demonstrating this and compelled the Air Force to try to then justify their enormous defense budget. That was a very satisfying puzzle. Here you can see US artillery during the Korean War uh, sometime in the early 1950s. The second component of a theory and your paper which, is, which this outline is going to guide, is the literature review of the current hypotheses. So what's a hypothesis? It's a statement predicting the relationship between variables, between a, a cause and an effect, or a cause and an outcome. Now, we can never test a theory. Theories are too large and broad. We break theories down into their component discrete hypotheses, and then we test each of the smaller hypotheses. In the course of this uh, course, you're going to come across many theories that'll have sub-hypotheses that are sort of broken away from the theory. So what does the literature review contain? It's not simply a list of books and articles that you read. A literature review is an attack on the current knowledge of the subject. So you want to survey previous hypotheses and explanations and predictions, right? Explanations are mechanical descriptions of how things work and predictions are if-then statements. If we see these, then those other things are going to happen. We want to highlight important or crucial cases that remain unexplained. An important case could be the case of, say, World War I. World War I is frequently used as a case of an accidental, unintended, undesirable war and is used as a model for how a nuclear conflict could break out. Or crucial cases. These are cases that have determined the argument one way or the other. Uh, was the Vietnam War shortened by bombing by the US Air Force? Or was it lengthened by bombing by the US Air Force? Right? So we want to highlight the cases that most people in the literature refer to when they're trying to test an argument. We want to identify contradictions or puzzles in the current theories or cases that are not well explained. We want to highlight the weaknesses of the previous theories. So this is a, a hatchet job. We're going after other theories and showing their flaws. We want to boldly challenge the conventional wisdom. 
don't always assume the most basic things are true. And finally, we want to identify the cases most commonly used to test the current theories, because we're going to need these later on, as I'll show you. Part three, the list of current hypotheses. So you've done the literature review in part two. Now you're going to make a list of the explanations and predictions of the current hypotheses. Now, it's very important here that we do not use a straw man argument. A straw man argument is one that's deliberately too easily falsified, probably because they're designed to provide easy, crucial cases. For example, you know, war is caused by angry people. I mean, how on earth are we going to falsify this? I mean, you, you have a war, someone's going to be angry, some of the people attacking are going to be angry. Is it, is it the anger that caused them to go to war? Do they just look angry? Um, you can't use that uh, kind of argument. Uh, so you want to come up with an argument that's, that's, that's uh, uh, not easily falsified. One that has uh, confidence in it. Also, you cannot use tautologies. A tautology is a non-falsifiable assertion. For example, war is caused by people who want war to happen. Right? How on earth would we falsify this? Right? How do we know that they wanted to cause a war or they didn't want to cause a war by the fact that the war was happening? We'd have to use some other way of measuring whether or not they wanted a war than by the war breaking out. Step four to propose improved hypotheses. Now, this is where your role comes in. You've done a survey of the shortcomings in the literature, and now you have to fix it. That's the core of your paper, coming up with a better solution to predict and explain the phenomenon that was previously not well explained. So it's very important that you provide the predictions. What will happen under what circumstances? as well as the explanation, which is, mechanically, how did this come about? Because it's not only about predicting. Political scientists must also have an insight in the mechanics. There are many steps between the emergence of an idea that turns into policy, that gets passed into law, that's then implemented uh, as grand strategy. All of those steps have to be identified. Counterintuitive theories and ones that oppose the conventional wisdom are the most interesting. So be bold, challenge the conventional wisdom. However, specify the scope conditions of your hypotheses. I mean, what are the limits of your theory? If you were to have a theory about the role of military government and procurement of equipment or military government in causes of war, it wouldn't apply very well to a country that doesn't have a military government. So you would specify the scope conditions of a theory of military government. It only applies to countries that have a military government or who have a significant presence of military people in the government or a government where the civilians have had prior military experience. All scientific tests are competitions between hypotheses, predictions, and explanations of rival theories. So every paper that's scientific is a boxing match between two or more contradictory predictions and explanations. You might prefer one theory over the other, but your job is to be an impartial referee in the match. It's that impartiality that creates validity of your test. So ultimately, we're aiming at the formulation of a set of generalizable hypotheses. Many students and scholars have a very specific interest or a specific country or region or time that they're interested in. But as social scientists, we're obliged to broaden beyond our one single case area of interest. We want to write for the phenomenon, not the case. So we want our theories to be generalizable to other cases, to other periods in time. So when you design your hypothesis, keep that in mind. Do not refer in your theory ever to a specific case. 
keep your generalization abstract. So what's a generalization? It's a covering law that applies to a group of cases, not to a single case. And that's our goal as social scientists. We want to expand our knowledge of theory. Even though as policy specialists, we might want to have a specific focus on a given country or a given case or a given time period, as social scientists, we have to reach beyond that. So your new model that you construct in this section must not refer to the case you're going to test it on. If you want to test it on a particular case, mention that case nowhere in your theory section. Not even briefly, not even once. If you do, you're committing a breach of validity because your favorite case or event is going to inspire your theory that is then going to be tested back on the case. And that is a circular argument, and that makes your scientific approach invalid. So don't do that. Never mention the case when you're developing your theory in section four or section five. And the simple reason is that you, is that you can't derive a theory from a case and then test it back on that case. That would be tautological. It would be uh, non-falsifiable. Step five, the identification of variables and their operationalization. So scientists in the laboratory will use things like weight or mass to uh, attribute measurement to an object. Right? Those are the indicators they use. Economists use amounts of money or inflation rates or levels of unemployment. Domestic political scientists, uh, Canadianists and Americanists, focus on votes or polling numbers. But in international relations and causes of war, we tend to focus on power. This is very hard to measure. Typically, we think of power as a relational uh, type of measure. It's what actor A could get actor B to do when actor B would otherwise not do it. And the likelihood of actor A succeeding is their level of power. So power is not a property. You don't have X amount of power, like X amount of airplanes or X amount of ships, but you have power over something else. And this is very difficult to measure. Now, ultimately, we look for these indicators in a model. Now, a model is a deliberately simplified representation of reality. Okay, it's an operationalization of our theory. Models don't have to be realistic because they're typically outrageous oversimplifications of reality. Life is complex. This lecture right now is influenced by the gravitational pull of Pluto, a small solar object very, very far away, but nevertheless having an effect. But the effect is so marginal that we don't have to highlight it. In fact, there are almost an infinite number of things that are influencing this lecture, the vast majority of which would be too difficult to measure. So a model is much simpler than that. Typically, we have three variables, and these are the variables I would request from your paper. The first variable might explain 20% of the variance between the cause and the effect. The second variable might explain 10 or 15%, and the last variable might explain 5%. All told, the first, second, and third variable together might explain 50% of the outcome. That it would be an incredible finding if you could find three variables that powerful. So, you know, you might recall uh, being in a grade school uh, um, uh, recreational yard and you're having a dispute with your friend and your friend is accusing you of not being realistic in one of your ideas. You can't make that argument with a model. Models are deliberately unrealistic. They're simplifications, oversimplifications of reality because we cannot 
comprehend the full complexity of the reality we're looking at, especially in the social sciences, which are so complicated and so uh, reactive. So we call this operationalized theory. When theory has indicators added and we've added measurements, that becomes operationalized theory. Now, ultimately in a model, our dependent variable or the outcome we're interested in is the focus of the problem. So you ask yourself, what do you want to explain? Well, how do arms races, for example, relate to war, right? What we're trying to explain there is war, the happening of war from a state of non-war to a state of war. So that is what we're trying to explain in the model. The dependent variable is typically the effect, right? We'll talk about that in a few moments. And it depends in turn on the independent variables, which are the cause. So what causes war or peace, right? And there could be a number of different explanations, which is the purpose of this course. Now, ultimately, it comes down to what is causation? And this is a huge philosophic debate, which we'll get to next. Here you can see U.S. Sherman tanks deployed in Korea in 1951. So David Hume in 1748 came up with three criteria for a causal relationship. You don't need to know these for any test, but I just raise it to show you why we don't use the words cause and effect in the social sciences, either in political science or in the hard sciences or in any science at all. We use the term uh, independent variable and dependent variable instead. So for there to be a cause effect relationship, Hume argued that one, you have to have constant conjoining meaning cause and effect are both sufficient and necessary towards each other. Two, there must be space-time contiguity. They have to be both simultaneous and co-located, occurring in the same spot. And number three, there must be temporal ordering. The effect must follow the cause. Here you can see U.S. Army soldiers fighting in Vietnam. So this is some of the notation that you're going to have in a model and you need to know these. Instead of cause, we say independent variable. Now it's a variable because it's got to vary. The values have to go up and down. Uh, it could be a very sunny day, and then it could become a very overcast day, right? It has to have different values. You could have a high level of inflation in the economy and then a low level of inflation. Now we call the cause an independent variable, abbreviated IV, because it has to be independent from prior causes. Remember, this model is a simplification of reality. We don't want the variable to depend on a previous variable that depends on a previous variable before that. It gets very complicated. You get this infinite recursion problem going back to the beginning of time if there is a beginning to time. So we artificially cut it off from prior events. All right, now there are, of course, statistical techniques that allow us to go back. Uh, to previous steps in a process, but uh, here we're going to have a simplified model. So we call the cause the independent variable. Next we have the dependent variable. This is the effect. Again, it's a variable. It has to change values. For example, it, uh, in this class, the variable we will most commonly focus on is the variable of war, which implies non-war, not necessarily peace, but a state other than war. So we have to have that variation. We're not only looking at war in this class. We are also looking at peace because we cannot explain the occurrence of war if we cannot also explain the occurrence of peace. They vary between each other. So the dependent variable is called dependent because it's dependent on the independent variable, right? It, it comes from, it emanates from the independent variable. And we abbreviate the dependent variable as a DV. So what's an intervening variable? An intervening variable is a variable that operates between the independent variable and the dependent variable. The independent variable is the cause and the dependent variable is the effect. But sometimes there's an intervening variable, in, uh, uh, abbreviated IVV, which changes the effect of the independent variable on the dependent variable. So here's, an, here's a, a historical case. It's a case of the effect of a political system 
on an economic crisis. Following the 1929 stock market crash in the United States, there was a general shuttering down of industrial output across the entire world. This led to mass unemployment in Europe and most countries of the world, but in particular the United States and Germany, which were both heavily industrialized and in the case of Germany, a large exporter. So you had millions of heads of households uh, out on the street without jobs. Now you had two political systems. In the US you had a first past the post system where in a particular district uh, the winner politically was one who had the largest plurality or the largest single group of voters in that district and they didn't have to be the majority. You just had to have the most votes. In Germany you had a party list system where the proportion of votes in the total society was then distributed according to the number of votes to each party. And the parties would post lists of their candidates and as many votes as were gotten would then be translated into the top names on that list and those would be the representatives in government. Now the unemployment triggered both left-wing and right-wing reactions. You had uh, both right-wing fascist political parties in both the US and Germany as well as socialist and communist movements. Now in the US, in a first past the post system, the dynamic of the process is that in order to get elected, you had to appeal to the largest group of voters in your district. So you typically wouldn't appeal to the communists or to the fascists that would be on the extremes of the political spectrum. You would target the middle. And so there was a moderating effect in the US. The result was the election of a Democrat president Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who implemented policies that uh, led to gradual uh, re-employment through public projects. In Weimar Germany, in contrast, political parties got representation. So on the one hand, you had the socialists and the communists, as well on the right, the NSDAP, National Socialist Deutschland Albertun Party, later the Nazi Party. And so the Nazi party was able to get representation in Germany in a way that didn't occur in the US. So here you have the same independent variable, an economic crisis leading to unemployment, leading to radical politics. But the intervening variable was different. You had a party list system to proportional representation in Germany, and you had a first past the post system in the US leading to very different political representational outcomes. In the US, you had moderate foreign policy. In Germany, with the arrival of Nazis in power, you had an aggressive foreign policy focused on war. And so two very different outcomes from the same effect because of the intervening variable. Now ultimately, we're looking for a correlation between the dependent variable and the independent variable, meaning as change of values occur in the independent variable, the dependent variable would also change values. And as I mentioned before, the dependent variable is what you want to explain, right? We want to explain war and peace in this class. And so that's what the dependent variable is going to be, right? Ultimately, we're trying to explain variance in the model, how changes in values in the independent variable causes changes of values in the dependent variable. And we want to show that as the independent value rises or drops, so does the DV value follow with it. Now, there's a question of direction. When we say there's a positive relationship between an IV and a DV, we mean they go up together, but they also go down together. For example, if I get um, you know, more customers, then I'm going to make more money. Right? But if I get less customers, I make less money. That's still a positive relationship because the IV and the DV are going up and down together. Now, a negative relationship is an inverse relationship, meaning the more of the uh, independent variable I get, the less of the dependent variable I get. For example, the wealthier a country is, the less likely it is to go to war. Right? But we can also reverse that inverseness which is as less money is made available to that society, so the probability of war goes up, okay? And we can always redefine variables to change them from a negative relationship 
to a positive relationship. Instead of saying the country gets richer, we can say the country's getting less poor, right? And reverse the value. So this is a depiction of a model for war. Now, of course, we spoke about this before. It's a misnomer. War here is really war slash peace, right? We're trying to explain both. We explain uh, uh, peace when there's no war, and we explain war when there's no peace. All dependent variables have to have at least two separate values. Now, in this particular model, we can see there's IV1, which is state A and B buy weapons. This is a model for an arms race. And you can see the plus that links IV1 to the DV. So the more aggressive the purchases of weapons, the more likelihood that war is going to happen. We can see IV2, the level of hostility, has a positive relationship on the incidence of a dispute, which is in, in this case an IVV, an intervening variable. And the more disputes there are, the more likelihood there's going to be a war. So this is just a model. I haven't tested it. I don't know if it's correct. It's reasonably intuitive. Most people think of uh, arms races in this way. And notice how there are two separate uh, causes here, two separate independent variables. Now, we need to know these two terms because they occur a lot in the literature. And there are two types of causes. They're ideal, which means we speak about them, but they almost never exist in the social sciences but uh, you should be familiar with what they mean. The first is a necessary cause. This is a required event, something without which the outcome could not occur. The dependent variable could not uh, vary to a particular value. For example, you have to have weapons to have a war, right? Now, we know this is not true, uh, at least in the intrastate conflict, or the interstate invasion by a non-state actor into Rwanda in 1993 uh, that led to large-scale genocide, the genocide was conducted with household implements, farming implements. Uh, there were almost no firearms used in the genocide. So weapons can be fashioned out of almost anything, which means you don't need weapons to have war. Now, you can always have a trivial necessary cause. Like, you, you can't have a war without oxygen. Obviously, because people can't breathe and the combustion effect of certain weapons wouldn't work. But that's trivial because the frequency with which you have no oxygen is very limited. And if you were to go to a place where there's no oxygen, such as fighting in space, you have weapons that are adapted to not requiring oxygen. So it's a trivial cause. In other words, it, it's uh, not useful to know that necessary cause. A second type of cause is a sufficient cause. This is modeled by an if-then statement. If this cause is observed, the effect will invariably follow. So, um, uh, if there's a revolution, a war will follow. This is a very commonly held uh, belief in the social sciences. Um, there's a revolution in France in 1789, in Iran, 1978, 1979, uh, in uh, um, uh, communist China, and shortly thereafter, the country was involved in a war. Okay, so we think we see sort of an inevitability here. If uh, a certain event occurs, a single cause, then the effect will inevitably follow. And you know, other other ones are, for example, if a leader seeks a war, a war will happen. Uh, that one's almost again trivial and non-falsifiable. In reality, necessary and sufficient causes in the social sciences almost never occur. At least I have never found one. Here you can see a Soviet uh, BMP armored infantry fighting vehicles uh, being lined up during an exercise. Now, sometimes there are curvilinear relationships. In fact, most of the time there are curvilinear relationships. And the way that we describe relationships qualitatively and in statistics generally are linear because of limits of our mathematics, and limits in the complexity of describing complicated waveforms. So here I have a, you know, almost a, a, a silly example of your paper writing for me. If you were to immediately embark on writing a paper for me now after, after class, uh, the paper won't be very good because you won't be at all stressed by the impending deadline uh, or, or frankly by um, me uh, about to read it. So it'll be a poor quality paper. Um, 
If, on the other hand, you were to write the paper the day before it was due, you would be shocked into um, neural paralysis and will have no good ideas and the paper will be dreadful and poorly written and badly edited. So ideally, you want to write the paper probably several weeks before the paper is due, when there's sufficient stress to give you that little spice to make the paper a sharp one and one that I'd be looking forward uh, to read. Most relationships in the social sciences are curvilinear. Too much of something and then you're going to have a metabolic collapse or a sudden shift in the relationship. So you can certainly recognize there's a curvilinear relationship in your paper. You know, the more, the, the more wealthy a country becomes, it doesn't necessarily become more Pacific. It might end up being so powerful and so wealthy, it's no longer sensitive uh, to the uh, interests of its poorer neighbors and then easily embarks on conflict, right? We can imagine that type of uh, event happening. Now, there's a couple of issues that, um, almost a checklist that you need to go through when you're um, writing on your uh, model, okay? And things you don't want to be doing. Number one, do not select on the dependent variable. This is a very serious dysfunction. What is this course about? It's about war? No, it's not about war. This course is about war and peace. We are not studying constants. For example, you look at the Earth and the shape of the Earth and its impact on weather. The Earth is round. The Earth is always round. So the fact that the Earth is always round can't explain change in weather. Because something that doesn't change, the shape of the Earth, can't explain or predict something that changes all the time, like the weather. So it's clearly not the Earth's shape. It's the Earth's location in the solar system, its rotation, its inclination, the rotation of the oceans on the shape of the Earth, caused by the rotation of the Earth at its inclination around the Sun and the role of the Moon. Very complex, but the shape of the Earth itself is a constant. So, whenever you're stating that you're studying something, you have to identify, identify both of the values. Let me give you an example of a fallacy or dysfunction that results from selecting on the dependent variable. It was once thought that the goal should be for militaries to win. So, someone studied uh, um, militaries' victories in the 19th century, and they noticed in the victories that almost always the country that won wore red. This is obviously the British building their empire in the 19th century and frequently winning their battles. And the conclusion is therefore, well, if, if the country that wins all the time is wearing red, uh, countries should equip their uh, uh, soldiery with red uniforms. But of course, this is invalid and it's so obviously illogical because the scholar forgot to count the defeats, such as Isandlwana, where the Zulu destroyed the British Army, or where the East India Company British Army was defeated in Afghanistan in 1839. If you also count the defeats, you're going to notice that there were plenty of defeats where soldiers wearing red were overrun. So you have to look at both categories. You cannot focus on a single category or you're going to come up with very silly and erroneous conclusions. And we want to avoid bias, and so that's why we have to look at both categories of the dependent variable. Now, a second issue is, more cautionary, most political scientist, uh, scientists look at events that are non-events, right? Wars are actually quite rare. Now, you know, at any one time in the world, the 200 plus countries, some of them are involved in a war. But if you were actually to map out every country all the years that it's been in existence for any given century. And uh, you do that for all the countries. And then you count how many years of war there are for each country. You'll find that countries are at war less than 1% of the time collectively. War is actually very rare. Most of the times, states threaten each other. They're not actually at war, but they're preparing for war. But we don't know what they're thinking. During the Cold War, for example, the Soviet Union and the United States never attacked each other. 
but it didn't mean they didn't plan to attack each other. So, why did the Soviet Union not invade Western Europe between 1945 and 1991? Was it because they didn't want to? Because the Soviet Union uh, was deployed defensively? Was it because they created the Warsaw Pact because they didn't want to get reinvaded by, uh, by the Swedes, uh, which the Russians fended off at Poltava, or, or get it invaded by the, the Napoleonic uh, uh, French, or the Wilhelmine Germans, or the Nazis? Or did the Soviets plan an attack every single night and simply conclude that NATO was too strong? So you have these two choices. Now, I have no solution here, except that so a, a political scientist, a social scientist, has to focus on the likely behavior of the decision maker. Typically, leaders anticipate reactions. Leaders just don't wake up and go, hey, let's have a war today. Leaders wake up and go, if I do this, if I move a chess piece on the board, what will my opponent do? If I embargo this country, if I build more missiles, if I, if I open up a dialogue, if I engage a cultural exchange, if I deploy my fleet off their coast, what will they do? And you anticipate what the other person's going to do. And they're anticipating what you're doing. And so you've got a complex process of anticipation. This is how leaders think and strategize and speculate about the consequences of their actions. So most events are a form of non-event, things that we cannot observe because most of the planning is going on inside the minds secretly of these leaders. And so we have to be aware of this as social scientists, that most of the things we're counting are difficult to count. I have no immediate, obvious solution to this problem. It's a methodological problem all social scientists face. A third issue are counterfactuals. Counterfactuals is a form of alternate history, things that never happened. Now, why would we deal in, in make-believe counterfactuals? Well, we've only had one nuclear war. At the end of World War II, the U.S. dropped two nuclear weapons on Japan. Nuclear weapons are hugely important. They have restructured international security and international relations for more than half a century. We need to be able to study them and study their consequences. And because we have so few cases, in fact, we have one case, although there are some analogy type cases we can use, we're forced to use counterfactuals. So counterfactuals are events that did not occur, but they could have occurred. An important consideration when we have counterfactuals is that they have to be plausible. They're things that could have reasonably happened. We're not going to have time travel. Um, I don't think it's plausible that aliens are going to land anytime soon and alter our international relations or, or, or the idea that they're here already. So our assumptions have to be co-tenable with reality. So let me raise a, a sort of a, a, a profound question. What if Adolf Hitler was killed accidentally, perhaps in an auto accident in the 1930s? What would have happened to German foreign policy? Would World War II have happened? This is an important question. It tells us about the relationship between a leader and their ideology and their political party and their followers. It tells us about other actors in Nazi Germany that also wanted war or didn't want war. It tells us about the role of deterrence and how the other countries could have uh, stood up more strongly and stopped Germany. So there's a lot of information in that assumption. Is it plausible that Hitler would have been, uh, could have been killed by an auto accident? Certainly. People have been uh, run over, although not political leaders um, on that level. So counterfactuals are valuable for asking those kinds of questions. If you're going to have a, a, an operation to assassinate political leaders, you will want to have a theory about counterfactual effects about killing leaders. But is it cotenable with reality? Cotenability is an aspect of, of uh, plausibility. Is this a likely outcome within the reality? Uh, a big example is World War One. Some people ask, would World War I have happened if the French and the Germans didn't create these very rapid train timetable movements where millions of soldiers were mobilized within a week to 10 days, deployed on each other's borders, and then you had a use it or lose it dilemma where if you didn't deploy the soldiers, then uh, 
then uh, your economy would crash because your factories were empty and there was no one to collect your harvest. So was the timetable uh, set up uh, of the mobilization of the respective armies leading up to World War One? Was that was it? Co is it is it plausible and co-tenable with reality that they could have canceled that whole timetable process and then avoided World War One? Well, some authors have argued, you know what, that's not co-tenable with reality because France didn't deploy the army quickly for cost. The French deployed their army quickly because they needed to get to Germany before the Germans mobilized and destroyed France's ally, Russia. So it wasn't done simply to get the soldiers to the border. It was done to show the French had commitment to save their Russian ally. So even if there was no trains available, the French would have found another way to rapidly come to the aid of their ally. So that counterfactual of, of making the uh, timetable uh, mobilization uh, replaced uh, or, or canceled is just it's not tenable with reality. Now, we, you cannot use counterfactuals in your uh, papers. All right, you have to use real historical cases. I don't care from what century. Uh, or from what region, because this course covers war in all its aspects from the beginning of time, although most of the theories we'll be looking at will be uh, recent cases. Uh, but you could use counterfactuals to confirm your theory. At the end of your paper, you could ask, if this independent variable didn't go this way, if Hitler had been assassinated, uh, if train technology did not exist, what would have the effect been on the dependent variable? Would war have occurred? So you could use it as a check at the end of your paper to speculate briefly in a concluding paragraph how history could have turned out differently. And this is an interesting exercise because it shows our depth and our understanding of particular independent variables. Next is we want to avoid constants, right? We spoke about this before. You can't predict outcomes using a constant. And one of the most common constants is human nature. This is problematic because if humans are peace prone, we would expect peace to occur all the time. If humans are war prone, then we would expect war to occur all the time. So human nature can't be a constant. Maybe personalities vary, but if personalities vary, then there is no one human nature. So in your paper, please avoid references, unless it's very sophisticated and it's well developed probabilistically a theory as a cause of war that comes from human nature. And the last point is theory precedes observation. You might recall we were talking about deduction, which is logical creation of theory, and induction, which is measurement in nature. And I said that in the social sciences, we have very often mix both because people are inspired by an image that goes on to a theory that becomes a story that becomes a more elaborate set of hypotheses that then develops into a great historical analysis. But we have to start somewhere. And so I ask you to look at your ceiling and tell me what color you see. Right? Tell me about the nature of the color of the ceiling that you're looking at. What color is it? What is the fact? Well, logically, as you're staring at the ceiling, you should know that color does not exist. It is a creation of your mind to explain the frequency of light waves transmitted by your eye and received by your brain. Uh, green, white, gray, black, red, they don't exist. Color, as a fact, is a creation of the mechanism of your mind, of the theory of your mind. So theory always comes before observation because facts are not real. Theory defines what the facts are. There is no color. So in your model, you're going to secretly use an interactiveness between deduction and induction and deduction and induction. But when you write your paper, you must be strictly deductive. You start your paper with an abstract theory. You do not refer to your case. You do not let the reader know that your theory was inspired by a case, even if it is. Because to be methodologically valid and sound, you must preserve the abstractness of theory. 
Because if your theory refers to a case, it's tautological, it's non-falsifiable, it's circular, and it's wrong. And the consumers of your research will lose confidence because you've broken that fundamental rule. So theory always precedes observation. Here you can see Portuguese soldiers involved in a suppression of an independence movement in Mozambique in the early 1970s. Step number six, test design. So we have competing explanations, right, which we developed by doing our literature review and we proposed a better explanation of the phenomenon with our own theory. So we've got these two rival theories. So what's a competing explanation? Well, they're rival explanations or rival hypotheses. Now, in the test design, hypotheses must either be falsified or put into competition with one another, with one another to see which provides the best prediction and explanation. What we're trying to do is establish correlation. Right? We're trying to show as one changes value, it has an effect that changes the value of the outcome. Right? This is not the same thing as causation. Correlation is sort of an association of movements between the independent variables values. Causation is showing that one thing causes another. Explanation is how we show causation. Uh, prediction is how we show correlation. Okay. Here you can see a section, or rather a detachment, of Soviet infantry having dismounted from a, a BMP. So let me ask you a question. Can you prove any cause-effect relationship to me? Let's take, for example, uh, gravity. Right? Imagine um, uh, I'm holding a pencil, and you could pick up a pencil right now. Is there any logical reason in which you can prove that the pencil will fall when you let go? All right, you might even just you know let go of it right now and say, well, there we go. I've just proven that the pen is going to fall when I let go. But you know what? You could drop it a second time, a third time, and a fourth time. But the millionth time you drop it, it won't fall. Right? That's always a possibility. And because of that possibility, dropping the pen in order to prove the pen will fall is not a valid test. Repeating an experiment that can be cancelled any time to generate a law undermines the law. So dropping the pen doesn't prove anything. So we have to come up with something deductive, not inductive, something logical. Let's think about it. Is there anything from philosophy that we can draw on? No, you know what? I, I know it sounds crazy, but um, you can't. There is nothing you could say, no logical argument you could make that will show that the pen will fall when you let go. All right, this is, you know, this is horribly tragic because you've paid so much money to come to Concordia to collect knowledge, and here I am telling you that nothing can be proven. Not, not in the political science course on the causes of war, not in a chemistry course, not in a physics course, uh, not even in a philosophy course on logic. There is absolutely no proof anywhere in the universe, right? Even if you were to build a time machine, and go back in time and survey every event involving gravity, and you were to go into the future using a time machine, uh, and you were to stay in the present and visit every inhabited planet to conduct your test, it would still prove nothing because uh, one instance will cancel the law. So there's no proof. You might as well just pack your bags and go home, right? Because all knowledge we have now is uh, uh, basically false because we can prove nothing okay but there's a solution we can't prove anything but we can disprove so there are two solutions to the problem of not being able to prove anything and the first comes from Ernst Mach a physicist who argued, well, you can't prove anything, but you can disprove. This is the criterion of falsification. 
So you cannot prove a theory to be correct, but you can disprove a theory to be incorrect. Now there are some probabilistic solutions to this. When you do statistics, you're going to notice that there's always a null hypothesis. The null hypothesis is the standard hypothesis, and it says there's no relationship. And so what you're trying to do in statistics is falsify the non-relationship. You're trying to falsify the null hypothesis. And by successfully falsifying the null hypothesis, you're then left with the hypothesis that shows a relationship. Sounds a little bit technical, a little bit confusing, but you'll, you'll learn that as you uh, repeatedly apply significance tests. Qualitatively, we have the same issue. We can't prove something, but we can disprove a relationship. So you're going to take a theory, break it down into discrete hypotheses with indicators, and try to disprove those. So remember that pen that you're holding in your hand that you're going to drop to prove gravity? Well, we can't prove the existence of gravity because that test can fail now or some indeterminate time in the future. But we could come up with a hypothesis that says there is no gravity. When you drop that pen, it falsifies the hypothesis that there is no gravity. That is how we structure our papers. Every hypothesis has to be redesigned so that we have something to falsify. That is how we create knowledge. Now, in reality, in terms of human nature, uh, our brains are designed to create contingent laws. For example, uh, when you woke up this morning and you went out and did your chores, you certainly weren't concerned that gravity is going to be cancelled at any moment and that you're going to be flung into space off the surface of the earth. You weren't holding onto the furniture or, or to the bushes outside of your house while you're putting out the garbage because your brain is designed to recognize patterns and then to turn those patterns into laws. But the standards of knowledge that we use for a scientific report uh, is much higher than the intuitive laws that we build our lives around. So that's why we have to be explicitly clear when applying the falsification criterion to hypotheses. You know, so um, we could come up with a, a, a hypothesis from a theory that, uh, for example, wars are caused by rapidly escalating our arms races. And so we do a study, and we look at a whole bunch of arms races that were rapidly escalating, and we find that there's in fact no link between a rapid escalation and the result of war. And so the hypothesis is then uh, falsified. So there's really two approaches to uh, falsification. The first one, the first method is, um, it could be false. Uh, we could have a hypothesis that's falsified by the available data, right? We expect there were to be a relationship between. Um, rapid arms buildups in war and we find in fact there's no relationship at all and so we falsify the assertion of the link between a rapid buildup of arms and the outcome of war. Uh, another solution is we have the availability of an alternative theory. Now here in the picture you can see a Nigerian government soldier during the Biafra War of 1969 and you can see a Canadian leopard bridge layer um, deploying its uh, bridge. So the second criteria is the competing criterion. Here, a theory is good if one, it can explain and predict the phenomenon, and two, it explains more than the previous theory or alternative theories. Now you guys might recall at the very beginning of the, uh, this discussion, you had to do a literature review. In the lit review, you had to uh, identify some uh, hypotheses and predictions. And then you examine the mistakes and the shortcomings and the errors in those predictions and you came up with your own better predictions. So you see, what we've created is an opposed boxing match. We have the conventional wisdom hypotheses and we have your new hypotheses and you are the referee judging to a test which is the better theory. So this is where the competing criterion comes in. It's better than the falsification criterion because instead of having a theory set up against the data, here we have two theories set up against each other. And this is why we do a lit review. 
because it's from the lit review that we identify what the conventional wisdom is. It's where we get our first set of hypotheses. And then we have to come up with our own theory. That's where we get the second set of hypotheses. So every scientific paper is going to be a competition between two separate theories. And your job as referee is to make sure the methodology is good so that we get valid results. So let's apply this. Let's think of uh, theory one argues that wars are caused by arms manufacturers. Right? And we go out and we study it. We find that 60% of wars do have arms dealers that are heavily involved. Right? And in 40% of cases, wars happen for other reasons. And then we have a second theory that wars are caused by alliances. And we see that alliance patterns play a role in 90% of wars that occur. And only in 10% were wars caused by uh, other causes. So it seems that alliances explain more and predict more than arms manufacturing. So alliance, the theory of alliances is a better theory according to the competing criterion. It explains more. Here you can see a German Leopard 2 tank. Now a major challenge at all times is the problem of pari passu or other things being equal in, in Latin. And what that means is how do you control for all of the other multitude of causes? Remember, reality is very complex, especially in the process of war. You know, what caused the war? Was it the type of regime? Was it the thinking inside the leader's head? Was it the influence of the military leaders, the media? Was there a popular mood for war? Were there alliance or geographic or geopolitical or resource or infrastructural imperatives? great level of complexity. For us to identify a cause, we need to know that the other causes are not important. Okay, we call this the Chateris Paribus, right, where we want to control for the effects of all the other things, keep other things equal. Right, so we want to be able to measure the effect of a cause while controlling for all of the other causes. Ideally, you want the number of cases necessary to demonstrate the variation in your dependent variable. So if you have a, um, a variation between cause, uh, between wars and peace, you want to have uh, independent variables. Uh, some you know, might draw from the, the alliance causes, some might draw from the type of regime type causes. Right? So we want to be able to isolate all the different causes. This is why we have at least two competing explanations. At least we'll have two separate sets or two uh, individual independent variables competing against each other. Uh, we could also take a look at a case across time, say France throughout the 18th century. This is called a longitudinal case study because it's longitudinal across time. It's, it's a study of a country across time. In that time period, France was sometimes at war and sometimes at peace. And we would look at the causes to see uh, which predicted the change of behavior across time. We could also look at two separate cases, right? And we could compare the two different cases and control for different variables between the two cases. Either the cases are the same uh, or they'd be different, right? There's no question that controlling for other causes is very, very complex and very complicated. And quantitative approaches tend to do this more easily than qualitative approaches. But controlling for other variables is just as important in qualitative research as it is in statistical analysis. So if you recall the model that we explored before, here you can see an arms race model where the independent variable one has state A and B buying weapons that influence the likelihood of war and peace. We have the second independent variable, which is hostility, which influences the occurrence of a dispute. You can imagine the intervening variable of dispute being a dispute that's a maritime dispute in the South China Sea between China and the littoral states of Vietnam, Malaysia, and the Philippines. Or it could be a terrestrial dispute on a border between, say, the Soviet Union and China in 1969, opposite the city of Khabarovsk. And uh, raises the question of whether maritime or terrestrial disputes are more prone to escalation of conflict. Now, when we're trying to control for other causes, it very often involves us reconceptualizing the causes that we have before us. Is there something wrong with the model? 
And I think some of you probably intuitively have that sense that, you know what? Weapons don't cause war. Weapons are very expensive. And to convince taxpayers in a democratic country or uh, resource creators in a non-democratic country to convince them to hand over so much of their wealth and treasure to spend on very expensive weapons is difficult. You need a justification for it. So when people buy weapons, it's normally not in a vacuum. They're doing it because they feel a need for a weapon, probably because the state feels insecure or the state feels it's entitled to conquer something and therefore it wants to build the weapons. So weapons don't build uh, uh, themselves. And weapons, therefore, can't cause war. So this is a better conceptualization of the arms race model. Here we can see that weapons don't cause war. Rather, weapons are an intervening variable between hostility and war. Countries that are hostile towards each other, for whatever reason, will purchase weapons. And the weapons may make war more likely. We have a whole lecture on the relationship between weapons and war. But weapons themselves are not the starting point. They're an intervening variable. So the terms we use here are that the uh, purchase of weapons by state A and B is a spurious relationship, meaning it's not a real relationship. The real relationship is hostility to war with uh, state A and B buying weapons as their intervening variable. So here we have what would be called the endogeneity problem. The endogeneity problem is when we have a cause that's embedded within the case, and it's not always easy to see. Here, the true source of the conflict, the true intervening variable is hostility. It's not state A and B buying weapons, right? Uh, so we have causation within the model, and uh, it's not true that it's coming from what we originally attributed to be the independent uh, variable uh, one, right? So endogeneity is when it causes also an outcome of the process being examined. Um, for example, arms races may be a cause of war, but they may also be the result of interstate hostility. So let's see different ways of controlling for other variables in a much more precise fashion. Most of the research on controlling for other causes comes from John Stuart Mill's logical methodology and is the basis for what we use uh, in the comparative method. Right? And I'm going to go through the basic logic of his applications. So the first here is the method of difference. Right? It consists of selecting circumstantially similar cases in many different ways. Right? Read when I say different ways, I mean different variables and then comparing the application of the cause in one case with the absence of the cause in the second case. Okay, this is also called similar case design or similar systems design. So here we have two students, student A and student B. Or it could be student A at time one and then student A at a later time, right? The longitudinal analysis across time. So student A and student B have the same family structure. That variable is the same. Student A and student B have the same amount of money. That value is the same. Student A and B, however, vary differently on the variable of how much they studied. Student A studied a lot. Student B was distracted and studied less. And then you have the outcome for student A, it's an A plus, and student B, it's a B plus. So you control for the variables of family and money so you can focus on the variable that matters. Now, what would be the application of this in a causes of war case? Well, if you wanted to look at the role of military governments, you could choose two cases in which you had one state with a military government and one state without a military government, but in every other way, the states could be similar. Say, for example, Israel and Pakistan. Both countries have faced adversaries that significantly outnumber them, both countries at times in their history have had weak external uh, um, allies. But you can examine under what circumstances the countries went to war, because in one you had a democracy, although uh, quite heavily militarized in uh, Tel Aviv, and in the other country you had a, um, a militarized government in different times of their history. 
uh, with the actual military governing uh, the country for periods of time. And you could then compare the outcome under certain crises to see whether they escalated a conflict. In the picture you can see a Viet Cong uh, resting. Here in another application of the method of difference, and this refers to the article by Edmund Beard in your reader, we have uh, two communities, Aboriginals and uh, Inuit, and we want to find out what explains their variation in their behavior towards war. We look at the variable of land and they're similar. We look at the variable of structure and they're similar. It's not a major incentive. However, we look at ideas and we see that the Aboriginals have a developed notion of conflict where the Innu don't. And this hypothetically explains variations in the outcome in the dependent variable of war. So here we've isolated two independent variables and we have two cases here that are similar in every way except for the key independent variable that explains the outcome. Again, you can apply this longitudinally across time. So we could learn if there is learning happening within a community by looking at the community, in, in this case Inuit, at time zero, and then looking at their new behavior at time plus one at some later moment. And we see there's change in the variable of ideas that results in a change in the values of the outcome. So if you were to look at France in the 18th century and examine over time their behavior, this would be one of the techniques that you could apply. John Stuart Mills also has a method of agreement. This is the most different case design. So you've got different cases, but they're all similar in producing the same value on the outcome, which in this case is war rather than peace. You can see in the inset picture, a monkey about to hit a man with a stick. So it's not true that only humans use instruments to inflict hurt. So here you can see the case of humans who are drawn by gold. They don't have tools and they uh, aggregate in large groups. Chimps have no interest in gold, lots of tools, and they aggregate in large groups. Bongos have neither gold nor tools and they aggregate in large groups. Dogs love gold and they like tools and they aggregate in large groups. So in this hypothetical example, you can see that the large groupness is the crucial variable that creates the outcome of war. Here again, we can apply the method, method of agreement, the most different case design between student A and student B. They have different family backgrounds. They have different wealth levels. But because they both studied, they both had a similar outcome in terms of good performance at school. So you could use these types of structures to control for variables when you select your cases. And the more competing crucial variables you can control for, the more likely you're to increase confidence in the variable of interest that you want to show as a relationship. Here you can see a Soviet soldier with an SA-7 surface-to-air missile. Uh, part 7, the case selection. This is where we test the theory or theories on the data. This is a very important section. This is where most of the disputes occur at my level. Did the researcher choose the right case to make a valid test of their argument? There are two kinds of cases. There are easy cases, and then there are hard or crucial cases. The hard case is the most likely case for the original explanation. Okay, I'll explain what that means. So you have your theory. How are you going to test your theory? You could try and test it against every case in the universe. You could go back in time, you could go into the future, you could examine every inhabited system. The problem is, uh, it's very costly. You're never going to be able to achieve it. Because of the extreme limitations in our resources, what we have to do is strategically select a case or a few cases that we test on that allows us to learn enough 
to make valid conclusions from our study. So there are two basic strategies. There are easy cases and there are hard or also known as crucial cases. So what's an easy case? These are cases that are easily demonstrating your relationship. We would want to use an easy case to highlight a model when it's hard to see this precise relationships. Uh, for example, if we wanted to get a close-up view of the impact of an economic depression on creating uh, radical political outcomes, we could focus on Germany in the 1930s. We're going to find exactly what we're looking for. It's going to be easy to make the links between the independent variable of the crashing economy and the dependent variable of an extreme uh, militaristic foreign policy. Uh, here you can see U.S. soldiers fighting in Vietnam. A second type of case selection strategy is the hard case or the crucial case. Let me begin with an example. Let's say you're an ice cream manufacturer and you wish to maximize ice cream sales, but you had a limited testing budget for marketing. Would you test your ice cream on people who like ice cream or people who are indifferent to ice cream? Of course, we will not test ice cream on people who are allergic or who dislike it. They will never buy ice cream. If we test it on people that like ice cream, we're going to basically confirm that there are people who like ice cream and that those people will probably buy ice cream. But we knew this already. If you test ice cream on people who are indifferent and those people indicate an interest in ice cream, then suddenly we've discovered something very valuable. We've suddenly learned where and to what extent we can alter the flavor of ice cream to make it sellable to this new market segment. Case selection strategies are the same for hard cases. We want to test our theory on a case where our theory is going to have a difficult time, where it's not obvious that our theory is going to work automatically or immediately. Why would we want to do this? Because when we are the referee in a boxing match between different theories, we want to give the advantage to the conventional wisdom, to the mainstream ideas, to the original set of hypotheses. Because if our theory can do better than the conventional wisdom while trying to predict an outcome in the favorite case of the conventional wisdom of the original mainstream set of ideas then our theory is not only strong but it's even stronger it builds up even more confidence so we're tilting towards giving the advantage to the mainstream conventional wisdom by where do we get the hard case? By taking the favorite case, the favorite easy case of the conventional wisdom. Remember the lit review that we did at the beginning? This is where we get our hard case. We go to the lit review, we read all the conventional mainstream ideas, we choose the case they use the most often. That's their easy case. Because if we can show that our theory predicts and explains better than their theories on their favorite case, then we create enormous credibility for our theory. So the logic of a crucial case study is to take an important case that is the favorite case of the conventional wisdom, their easy case, the case where their theories are most likely to work, and to test our theory against their easy case. That becomes our hard case. That's why the literature review is so important. Not only are we collecting mainstream hypotheses, we're also creating the conditions for a test by knowing where to test. What case do we choose? So we choose the crucial case from the easy case of the conventional wisdom in the literature review. I cannot emphasize enough how important 
this step is. In the photograph, you see the U.S. aircraft carrier Ranger during the Vietnam War. Case selection. Case selection is never easy. And these are additional considerations that should be thought of when you're doing your case selection. These are not easy solutions. What you want to do is to demonstrate a causal relationship by falsifying all of the competing alternatives, all the other explanations. Now, this is a problem because if we don't falsify the pro all the other explanations, we could have what's called the overdetermination problem. If someone crosses the street and they get run over by a car, and at the same time they get shot by a bullet, what killed them? Getting run over by a car or getting shot? Wars have many complicated causes. As you will see when we look at the First World War in a future lecture, there are ten causes. If we falsify six of them, we're still left with four, and we still have to disentangle the complex spaghetti of these different causes. Which one explains the most? Which one explains the least? How do they interact? Is one of them an intervening variable rather than a true cause? This is complicated. Now, there's different ways we can do this. We could use variance analysis. Here, we're looking at correlation. We're trying to show the timing of the change in the independent variable somehow is associated with the change in the values of the dependent variable at the same time. But there's always lags. Uh, the stock market crash occurred in 1929. The Nazis get into power as with Hitler as Chancellor in 1934. War occurs in 1939, 10 years later. So you have this expectation that things take time because the processes are not always visible. The overdetermination problem is also called the multi-finality problem. When we have too many causes predicting the same outcome, it becomes difficult to disentangle them and distinguish them. Another process is to compare explanations uh, in their mechanism. This is called process tracing, and it comes from anthropology. Here, you focus in, and you follow a decision, and you trace it from person to person, from institution to institution, uh, it enters the public domain and media as it evolves and transforms and then ultimately ends up as a decision by the elite decision makers in society. Ultimately, we want each independent variable to be individually falsified and we want one or, or, or at least uh, a few that remain to then be disentangleable. This is not an easy problem to solve. Part 8 the evaluation of findings, and the policy prescription. Political science has a goal. People don't do it in a vacuum. It's expensive. Governments and agencies pay for reports because they think it'll help them make better decisions, that it'll be in the public interest. However, you cannot allow your goal to bias your study. You must be strictly neutral when you design your analysis because you're trying to create valid conclusions for decision makers. In your project, in the conclusion, you want to evaluate the predictive and explanatory power of your resulting test. And then, most importantly in the real world, you want to recommend subsequent research. How else do we push? the research limits. And then you want to translate that into actionable policy recommendations. Political leaders are not academics. They need you to translate your findings, whether they're qualitative or statistical, into language they can use in politics or in policy formation in the bureaucracy. They don't have the expertise to analyze 20 variables. So you have to simplify it. You have to boil it down to the essentials that they can use to change tangible decisions made by the state. Now, in your course, I actually don't care what your goals are. You have complete anonymity. I will never share your study with anyone. And as far as you and I are concerned, I will happily 
erase any paper you've written for me uh, when you've concluded the course. But in the real world, where I have been paid to do research, uh, sometimes there are real consequences. Uh, if you take a position against your employer, they will terminate your contract and uh, they will cut your funding. And this has happened to me. So in the real world, policy recommendations are uh, very important. Academically, uh, they're not so important. Uh, but I want you to balance it when you write your paper as if the study you were creating uh, had a real impact. So here's a summary set of ideas on uh, what is a good theory. You want your theory to have leverage. You want to explain as much as possible. Get away from only explaining one case, even if that case is an enormous anomaly. You're a social scientist. You have to reach beyond your favorite cases and connect with other social scientists and explain broader phenomena, while at the same time developing your in-depth knowledge of your particular case of interest. You want your theory to be parsimonious. Keep the theory simple. Do not have more than three independent variables in your qualitative model or your qualitative, your quantitative model. Why? Because people can't absorb more than three independent variables. Uh, decision makers can't. Uh, it's, it's far too complex for them. And if you think about it, the first independent variable will explain 30%, maybe 20%. The second one will explain 15%. The third one will explain 5%. You'll never explain more than 50% of variance using three independent variables. They drop off pretty quickly. Number three, you want your model to be explicitly falsifiable. I know it sounds ridiculous, but the best papers are ones which start out by saying in the very introduction, to prove me wrong, find this. That kind of statement creates enormous confidence in a paper. Hiding your paper behind big words and, and uh, literary flourish and, and poetic uh, descriptions is not honest scientific work. You want to be as explicit as possible, in their face as possible, to make as simply crystal clear uh, how um, uh, to see if they're wrong. Now, you also want to come up with useful generalizations. You want to contribute to the general field and not come up with very narrow predictions and explanations for the phenomenon uh, that you're focusing on. You want your test to be reproducible. If you get run over, anyone should be able to pick up your research project, continue it, and uh, probably reproduce almost the same results if they're using the same case study. And finally, there, there, there can be some heuristic value to a research project. You could set up a test in which you think you're going to fail in which you think your new theories are, are, are going to flop. And that's perfectly acceptable. You are not graded on the success of your theory. You are graded on the validity of you being an impartial referee in constructing a methodologically sound, positive test of your theories on a crucial case. That is how you are graded. It would actually make a lot of sense to test some of the crazy ideas coming out of politicians today uh, because they believe the ideas, their followers believe the ideas, you may not. So it's perfectly valid and logical to test their theories, even if you have a very strong inkling that their theories are going to fail. This picture here is of a, an American tank in Vietnam. Now, a note on stochastics. What the hell are stochastics? Stochastics is the dis probability distribution of probabilities. All observable behavior in nature can be approximated by a normal bell curve. All right, sounds uh, almost peculiar, but you can actually uh, reproduce this yourself. If you were to take a small container, and I would do this uh, if I had a classroom, and in that container you would have four numbers little pieces of paper with four numbers on it, one, two, three, and four. And then you'd pass it around and ask each student in a class to take out uh, four of those little pieces of paper. Uh, you could, from a, a large container of those different four numbers, you could pick out four fours, that would be 16. Uh, 
You could also pick out four ones, which would add up to four, or any number in between. So you could have a number that's four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, or sixteen. If you were to ask each student to add up those numbers, and then you were to, on the board, aggregate the numbers together, uh, where the you know every time a student said a set of four, you'd put a, a, a square on top of the four, and whenever a student said eleven, you put a square on top of the eleven, and then you piled up those squares, you would end up with a bell curve, what looks like a mountain, with a peak in the middle, and on the left and right edges you'd have sort of a trailing off slope that would go off uh, infinitely. Uh, that's how you create a bell curve. Now the central limit theorem is a theory about the implications of a bell curve on reality, and there are two implications. The first is that extreme outcomes occur with very low frequency, which is sort of obvious. Um, if you were to rerun World War II a thousand times, how many times would, would Hitler have prevailed? Probably very few, because of the overwhelming odds against the expansion of Nazi Germany. Number two, highly unlikely events are more likely to occur as numbers we are observing are smaller. So if we had a bell curve made up of a thousand events, very unlikely Hitler would have won. But if we have a bell curve of only nine events, it's actually more likely that a discrete block of victory would have occurred in that block. Now, why does this matter for us? Right? The idea that if events occur in small numbers, you're going to get far more variance than if you have a few numbers. Well, uh, it comes down to how we select our cases, okay? which I'll show you in the next slide. Here you can see a normal bell curve. You can see the peak in the middle, where, in a, where events are most likely, and uh, on the tails on the left and right, where they're least likely. So, in February 27, 1991, a Scud missile was launched by the Iraqis against an American base at Dahran. The missile is very inaccurate. But in this one instance, it landed on a barracks in Dahran, uh, housing uh, U.S. Air Force personnel, uh, and it killed 28 American soldiers and an airman and airwomen and wounded 100. Uh, enormous loss. The consequence was that the U.S. put billions of dollars every year for the next two decades into missile defense. Now think about it. What was the logical conclusion from this attack. If a million Scud missiles had been fired at Dahran, the likelihood of a missile hitting the barracks probably would have been zero. These missiles are incredibly inaccurate. So the probability that a missile would have hit that barrack is, is virtually zero. The policy conclusion, however, was different. Because of this one in a million strike, huge amounts of money were misspent to save lives that'll probably never be lost again under similar circumstances. This tells us that when we choose a case, we have to situate the case in terms of its likely probability. If you look here in terms of the total losses that the U.S. suffered during their uh, 1991 um, attack on uh, uh, Iraq's uh, soldiers in Kuwait, you can see the U.S. lost uh, soldiers in the air war, soldiers in the land war, uh, a lot of soldiers in accidents. But in terms of combat losses, about a third of their losses occurred in that one single strike. So when we choose a case, we have to ask ourselves, what is the likelihood of this case ever occurring again? And therefore, is it the type of typical case that we want to test on? Um, if, if we were to test uh, World War II as a case of uh, an extremist political dictator uh, trying to win a war, uh, how likely is it that Hitler would have won? And therefore, uh, how useful uh, of a case is World War II for that type of test, where we're testing uh, a dictator that had an even chance of winning? Perhaps Napoleon or Louis XIV had a much better chance of winning than Adolf Hitler. So it matters what the likelihood of that case would have been if we'd run that case over um, uh, an infinite time and created a bell curve and then estimated the likelihood of uh, an outcome. Now I should sort of put as a backdrop assumptions about determinism in this class, but uh, that will come up when we have our 
lecture on statistics. A major organizing principle for causes of war classes, which has an impact on methodology, comes from Kenneth Waltz, who wrote a dissertation called Man, the State, and War, in which he analyzed the impact of human nature versus other causes on the frequency of war. What he did was he grouped together the independent variables on a hierarchy going at the top from human nature down all the way into the international system. And we use that same structure to organize causes of war classes because they build on each other. Now at the apex, we have human nature. This was the target of his dissertation, and we've already talked about this briefly. And human nature, because it's a constant, can't explain anything. And Kenneth Waltz uh, does exactly that in his dissertation in 1959. We won't discuss it uh, uh, here again, but you'll see on this levels of analysis that there are other variables that are sort of related. So we have the first image, which are individuals, individual psychology, individual uh, decision-making uh, frames. We're going to focus on the individual and how individuals can be causes of war. Then we drop down to bureaucracies and below that domestic political systems. So we can see ever widening structures involving more and more people. Then we get to the second image, which is the state, right? What kind of regime does the state have? What kind of structure does it have with its people? We call this the monad or the individual unit of analysis. Then we go down to the dyad. A dyad is a pair of countries, typically two countries that are in confrontation, that are involved in an arms race, that have deterrence against each other. Then we can uh, focus on the region, which is a collection of states. And then finally, we have the third image, which is the international system, the whole system together. Now, we do this to avoid the problem of reductionism. Reductionism is when we apply the laws in one level to, the, to, the, to another level where it's inappropriate. A lot of the ways that we describe individuals as being angry or happy or afraid doesn't apply to states. Countries are not afraid. They might be insecure and manifest insecurity, but they don't have personalities. They're aggregates of individual decision makers and stakeholders. So we don't want to anthropomorphize the state. We also don't want to apply the logics of, say, a domestic political system, how two political parties are interacting, to how two states are confronting each other. Analogies are very, very tempting, but I strongly recommend students describe precisely what they're talking about and always avoid metaphors or analogies except in cases where they're warranted because it's so difficult to understand a concept. But frankly, that occurs rarely. Here you can see uh, what looks like a British-French fight, and it could be the Battle of Waterloo. So definition of war. Wars are armed contests between two independent political units. So we're not looking at interstate conflict or conflict within a state, like a civil war or an insurgency. For that, there are other courses. For that, uh, uh, there are other courses in the program and courses that I teach. So this armed contest is by means of organized military force, usually fought for political ends. Not all wars need to have casualties, although the militarized interstate dispute and the correlates of war generally indicates you have to have a minimum of a thousand battle deaths uh, for a, uh, an, uh, an event, a conflict between two countries to be classified as war, but this would of course exclude the Falklands War in 1982, which had less than a thousand battle deaths. Not all wars need to be declared. In fact, most wars, even in the 19th century of Europe, were not declared. Wars do not have to be fought for political ends, as Karl von Clausewitz said. Uh, war is politics by other means. Sometimes war is fought for glory. Napoleon uh, certainly thought war was glorious. Peace, in converse, is the lack of militarized contest between two independent political units. So peace is the opposite. So if you want to explain war, we have to be able to explain peace. They describe two different states of the same object in the international system or between the dyad or in the region.
here's a representation in red of interstate wars between 1945 and 2000. You'll see that uh, in the post-World War II period, most wars were within states. In fact, before the 1945 period, and historically, most wars occur within states. In fact, most wars, uh, in terms of the number of people that were killed, have occurred within states. Intrastate conflict is a major source of suffering and death. But this class is about interstate war. So we're not going to be examining theories that look at interstate conflict, except as they affect the likelihood of war occurring between states. Now, there are three types of causes of war that you need to be aware of so that you could avoid them because they're too general, too general to be useful to make predictions. So there are three types, first of all, of causes of war. The first is a cause of war as an activity, right? We think of this as, as a constant related to human nature. This is sort of an anthropological perspective. What gets young men and women into uniform? What gets them to fight on the battlefield and not run away when they, when they die? What gets them to keep fighting when it looks like the goal is, is hopeless or too costly? Number two, the cause of a specific war. This is the work that historians do. I mean, why did World War I happen? Was it a social movement? Was it propaganda that the leaders of Germany believed the social Darwinist ideal of Germany building an empire like the English in Europe? Or number three, which is what we want to do, which is explain variance as a cause of war. When are the conditions there that cause wars to happen and when not? This is what political science does. We are looking for patterns of behavior. This is the third cause that we're going to focus on. Of course, the first cause is important. We need to know why the individuals mattered, why they showed up to fight. The second cause matters too. When we test our theory on a case, we need to know what happened in the case. But in political science, we're focused on the third cause. So my teaching ultimately, and I, I have to repeat this over and over again because this must appear in your paper, is to both explain the logic of a class of cause of war and then to discuss the contemporary statistical findings on that relationship. And I'm going to try to do this in my lectures. So I'm going to give you both a correlation and an explanation. The why and the what. And I want you to do the same in your paper. There's been a lot of statistical work in the last 50 years. Most of this work is general findings, right? And there's always exceptions to them. And they're not always right, because not all the statistics are well conceived, as you will learn in this class, as you design your own statistical models. You can always come and see me, and we can discuss case study strategy and the types of cases you should be looking at for a particular test for your paper. So here are the two, two general causes of war that I wish you to know and then to banish from uh, you ever applying it. Number one, states disagree on the shared distribution of power. Right? So the logic here is that you know, if you have two countries and they disagree on the shared distribution of power, then they're going to have war. If they agreed, then a weaker state would always submit to the stronger state. So when you have full information, the smaller state will look at the bigger state and go, you know what, I can't survive. I don't want to pay the additional costs. So I'm just going to give you what you asked for, and then we're going to avoid the costliness of a war, and peace will happen. It is a puzzle, of course, why this doesn't happen, and we're going to logically discuss why states will go to war, even though if only they shared information, war would not happen. The second too general cause of war is the argument that war happens when one, the status quo becomes intolerable. The status quo meaning the present. That something is, is in the present that the state's leadership does not like and they can no longer tolerate it and have to act by going to war. What that precisely is, we don't know. And number two, the state preempts a feared attack. In other words, the state doesn't want to go to war, but it believes it's about to be attacked and therefore it gets the advantage of moving first by surprising the enemy before it gets attacked. An example would be um, 
the collapse of the tripartite agreement. Um, Czechoslovakia sold weapons to Egypt in 1955. Israel became fearful, and so they attacked Egypt. So, you know, here are some examples. Um, here we have uh, the 1938-39 uh, attack on Finland by the Soviet Union. Finland and the Soviet Union disagreed about the level of power. The Soviet Union thought they could easily overrun Finland. Finland disagreed. There was a very punishing conflict and ultimately the Soviets accepted an exchange of territory and made peace with Finland. The Soviet Union disagreed about the level of power, but they were wrong and Finland was right. Here we have the 1950 North Korean invasion of South Korea. The North Koreans found the existence of a capitalist democracy allied to the West in the Seoul government intolerable to their ideology. They couldn't not fight to reunify the peninsula. So they invaded, triggering the Korean War for the next three and a half years. Here we have a picture of a T-34-85 tank sold by the Czechs and the Russians to the Egyptians, which then led to the 1956 Israeli attack on the Egyptian army in the Sinai. Here the Israelis believed they were going to be the target of an attack, and so they attacked first. They not so much preempted Egypt as prevented it, but it really depends on the time scale. Would Egypt eventually have attacked Israel in the future if they had mastered their weapons. So there are some general guiding principles in the causes of war. There is no single cause of war, especially in the incredible social complexity of a society or opposing societies. There is no unified theory of war. We and you are still working on that. Historians have argued that wars are historically unique and that we therefore cannot approach them as patterned, repeated behavior. Of course, as political scientists, we reject this. We see patterns and we seek patterns. Most wars are territorial. People fight for land because they live on land. And people defend land because once you've lost land, you're probably never going to get it back. And wars that are accidental do not exist. I'll give you an example of a commonly cited accidental war. The US and the British stood off uh, at Concord. And this seems to have been triggered by an accidental shot by one of the soldiers that ultimately led to uh, violence that um, probably led to the start of the American War of Independence. This is a type of story that you see in some of the Hollywood movies where you've got two medieval armies and they're facing off, neither intending to fight, and there's a snake appears below one of the horses and one of the knights draws their sword to kill the snake and it's misinterpreted and everyone draws their swords and the two armies meet. That type of event which uh, is used as a model for an accidental nuclear war where a young soldier misinterprets a radar blip and then launches a rocket and then you've got rockets that are launched in retaliation and rapid escalation to a full-scale nuclear war. That kind of model doesn't exist, at least historically. We've not been able to find an example. The closest we've been able to get to a case is the accidental, alleged accidental war of the Seven Years' War in North America. Some historians argue that the war was accidental in the sense of being unintentional, meaning beforehand no one wanted the war to happen, or very few did. So you have the King of France and King George of England uh, both wanting to avoid war because there was very limited economic value in North America, and because of the domestic consequences for their budgets back in Europe. And also because uh, they were depending on war factions to remain in power and to maintain their influence, and they depended on these factions, but didn't want to pay the cost of the conflict. So there was very little desire for war. However, it was very difficult in those days to coordinate the movement of military forces because there was no radio, there was no telegraph systems. Orders took months to travel by ship. You could therefore assign a mission to a colonial government 
Uh, and it was a sort of very general order. And sometimes these ships would carry the orders to the other side of the world, to Asia. And you could tell the ships to protect themselves against a local threat, but not to escalate to a full-scale conflict. Sometimes these ships or these local governors on distant lands would be given great latitude in terms of their powers. Now, we would call this a principal agent problem, where the leaders in London and Paris wouldn't have complete control over their subordinates. Now, here in the map, where you can see in the center, across the Appalachians, you can see the Ohio River, is the Ohio Valley. And here you had uh, French Governor Duquesne of Canada and British Governor Dwindle of Virginia. And they, however, did see the war as worthwhile for their local political goals. The British also did not believe that the French could control their subordinates. So they didn't negotiate an agreement to try to limit the escalation of conflict if it occurred. So a significant problem was that information passed to London did not go to the British Prime Minister first because he didn't think the American, uh, 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 the British in, in the Americas mattered, but instead went to the British Board of Trade, which didn't grasp the consequences of the conflict. So the English and the French regional governors in North America were very aggressive, both seeking advantage in the Ohio Valley, the English more than the French, and both falsified and exaggerated reports of the other's hostility in their reports back to London and Paris. So the crisis starting point began when the British governor of Massachusetts, William Shirley, who wrongly claimed that the French had attacked Kennebec, but then he discovered his mistake was too late once the report had already been sent. On May 28, 1754, the British and French troops had a chance encounter in which the French leader Jumonville was accidentally killed and violence escalated quickly from that encounter. Uh, so it's just sort of a historical curiosity. British Colonel George Washington surrendered to the French during these engagements. Well, defensive preparations of each side were seen as preparations for attack by the other because you could always base offensive soldiers in a defensive base before they would set out on their attack. The French uh, minister Houillet exclaimed about the Ohio Valley, quote, an object which was in itself insignificant as this one could be the cause of war, close quotes. In June 9, 1755, war erupted between the French reinforcements from Europe and British colonists. And ultimately, this escalated into the uh, Seven Years' War equivalent in North America. Ultimately, this is how Quebec came to be conquered by the English in the subsequent war. It was not done by preconceived calculation, but uh, as an unintentional result of an escalation process, no one predicted. So this historical case is discussed because it's a close analogy of the current fact that about half of the world's destructive capability is in nuclear weapons, and that these are in submarines um, underwater. And then arms control is a technique to get control of this technically dangerous aspect of nuclear weapons, that they're uh, beyond the immediate control of the political authorities, and that an accidental war is always possible. However, if you break down any accident, like an insurance analyst would after, a, let's say, a car accident, uh, it, it comes down to um, essentially risk. When you get in your car to drive to the market to buy bread, your goal is to buy bread. But the act of stepping in a car means you are accepting the risk of an accident, of driving up onto a curb and hitting someone, injuring pedestrians. So the act of driving is itself not an act of violence, but it's potentially an act of unintentional violence. And accidental wars should be seen in that sense. The decision makers risk war to get something, but sometimes they can't manage those risks or they don't predict the risks and they lose control and the outcome is conflict. Now, uh, yeah, here you can see uh, the later outcome of the uh, conflict. You can see the 13 colonies held before 1763 and ultimately the English conquest of the French part of uh, North America. So none wanted war. Now the effects of war. There is an illusion which I think is quite profound that war opens up creative forces that are positive. Without World War II, the Germans would not have found an incentive to build jet aircraft, the British would not have worked on radar, the Americans would not have developed nuclear technology, 
permits nuclear reactors. This is false. Despite the popular belief that war stimulates social cohesion, technological growth, and economic recovery from depression, the overwhelming evidence is that war diverts scarce resources from long-term economic development. Turning scarce iron into a tank doesn't then create a tractor when the war is done. You, you just end up with a rusting tank on some beach or in a jungle or in a desert somewhere. Unless a defeated state is reintroduced by the victor state into a liberal capitalist economic order, which is what uh, permitted Germany and Japan to regrow after World War II, the defeated powers almost never recover. If you look at uh, Cold War uh, East Germany after World War II, it took it decades to recover because it didn't benefit from the same economic assistance that the U.S. provided West Germany. If you look at the Gaza Strip, if you look at uh, Soviet-occupied Poland or North Korea, or lingering infrastructure problems in Vietnam before it opened up its economy in the 1990s, states that are not reintegrated may never recover. Winners typically lose five to seven years of economic growth. If World War II had not happened, the American household would have received a television set almost a decade earlier. However, states that lose suffer between 21 to 25 years of economic delays in their growth, four times worse. Germany and Japan would have been much better off if they never went to war, if war had never occurred, and they had rebuilt and recovered their economies from depression without the Second World War. And for that, England, France, certainly the Soviet Union, and even the United States, which made some profit uh, from World War II by selling weapons uh, to its allies, even the United States would have been better off without World War II. So uh, war has a consequence even if it's not easily forgotten in the period after the war is over. So why do we study war? Well, it wasn't until the end of the Napoleonic Wars that European diplomats recognized that war, in addition to hegemony, which is where one country dominates the others, was undesirable. Before the Napoleonic Wars, the big threat was hegemony, that one state would take over and imperialize all of Europe. But after Napoleon, and after Napoleon unleashed republican forces and revolutionary forces that toppled governments and led to chaos and widespread violence, the European states also agreed that large-scale war was an impediment to collective wealth and commerce. And so that's why we study war, because it is generally agreed upon to be collectively an undesirable outcome. This is a short list of states that have been destroyed by conquest since the end of the Napoleonic Wars. Many of these were incorporated into larger states. Many of them were destroyed and their ethnic communities were integrated into the new state. But it's to show you that war has consequences. And while the death of states is rare, it happens and it's very often irreversible. Defeated states are not often liberated. Sometimes the death of states is associated with the death of societies and the death of identity. And that weakness in the international system has serious consequences.